morning. Uh, we are starting a new Bible study today. Uh, we are going to look at the first and second letters of Paul to the Thessalonians. Uh, and uh, today uh, is going to be a little different. I'm going to give you a lot of information about uh, Thessalonica, uh, the, the town itself, as well as uh, a little bit about who Paul is and um, some of the major themes of Thessalonians. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to go to our website at www.messiahlutheran.net, uh, where you'll find a handout that I gave uh, to the class, uh, the classes that I taught this in that have a lot more information in it and, and touches on the things that I'm going to touch in briefly in this 20 minute uh, lesson. Uh, so with that, I'll begin. Uh, Thessalonians was written to the uh, uh, to the church that Paul started in Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica is along the Aegean Sea. It's in northern Greece. It's part of Macedonia. Um, Macedonia was where Alexander the Great was from. You probably heard of him in your uh, lessons around the uh, fourth century. He uh, he created an empire. And uh, he wasn't actually Greek, although we tend to remember him as Greek because the, one of the first things he did was he took his little kingdom of Macedonia uh, that he inherited and he conquered the Greeks <laughs> with it. And then from using the power of Greece and the wealth of Greece, he then uh, created an empire uh, that a few centuries later Rome swallowed up into the Roman Empire. Uh, so Macedonia is actually, uh, Greek, uh, Thessalonica is actually named after Alexander the Great's uh, sister. Uh, Thessalonica in the second century, 167 BCE, they enthusiastically became part of the Roman Empire. And that's important for our story. What I mean is that before Rome was a huge, powerful empire, Thessalonica kind of signed in, put their chips in that basket. And it paid off. Uh, Rome treated them as a special province of Rome. Uh, they, they retained a little bit of independence. And more importantly, when Rome went to build a road to connect up their eastern colonies as their empire marched east, uh, they built that road right through Thessalonica. And it took this uh, small place and made it a fairly wealthy, medium-sized city. And that's what Paul finds when he visits there. Uh, not a large city like Athens or Alexandria or Rome, uh, but more of a mid-sized sort of city, probably about the size of Jerusalem at that time too. So it's it's a fairly big place is what we'd want to say. Um, and because they uh, because they valued their their Roman uh, occupation and and they delighted in that and they got resources from that. They created a cult of Ro the Roman emperors. Uh, that was the the city cult. I believe in these Roman cities, they all had one sort of cult that they were known for. Although many different religions were represented in, in all these Roman cities, but the cult they were known for was the cult of Augustus, uh, which worshipped not just the uh, emperor Augustus of history at that time of Paul, but also simply of uh, the emperors overall. And this is important for our letter because Paul's going to use a lot of that cult language of the emperor in Thessalonica in his letters to the Thessalonians. And, and to us, it just sounds like religious language that uh, Jesus is our king and he's our savior and he's going to bring peace and he's going he's gonna to be good for the people. Uh, that just sounds like religious talk. But the Thessalonians would have heard this. Wow, Paul's using the exact same language of this cult of the emperor, but saying it about Jesus. And the indication is that our true king is Jesus, not any emperor in, in any town far away. Uh, the second thing I want to do <coughs> is I want to talk about just how crazy and radical Paul is, because I think that's important for us to, to keep in mind. So Paul is a contemporary of Jesus. He was alive when Jesus was alive before the resurrection. He might have been a little younger, 10 years younger or so, but he was a contemporary of Jesus. He's also Jewish and he's educated and he seems to he could have been wealthy because he's a citizen and, and mostly wealthy people were citizens. 
But Paul was not a follower of Jesus. Uh, in fact, we know from the story of Acts and from things that Paul says in his letters that Paul was um, uh, actually uh, w was actually opposed to the Jesus separatists that the that the Jesus followers were in in the Jewish faith. Uh, and so he was hired by the Sanhedrin, by the leaders of the Jewish church, let's call it, uh, to stamp out these separatists, the, these um, these people who were who were kind of uh, creating a new religion based on Judaism. Um, that was a threat to Judaism overall. And, and he was given the right to do that violently if it need be. And so uh, Paul killed Christians, early Christians, Acts tells us, and then uh, God stops Paul in his tracks on his way to Damascus to uh, break up a, an early Christian church. And, uh, and and Jesus appears to him, and Jesus tells him to follow him and, and to become his disciple. Uh, and, and Paul calls himself an apostle in his letters, uh, which was a designation the early church gave to those people who followed Jesus when he was alive. And so... It feels like the other apostles didn't think Paul was quite an apostle because he didn't know when Jesus was alive, uh, like us, he knew when Jesus was alive in the resurrection. He claims to have had a vision of the resurrected Jesus. Uh, but yet Paul wanted that upper designation because Paul was clearly an early mover and shaker in the Christian church. This conversion of Paul to Jesus Though it happened after Jesus died, it probably didn't happen very many years after Jesus died. Um, so Paul was an important early figure. And, and here's what we can't say enough. Um, for two reasons, Paul has a greater impact on Christianity than everybody. Everybody except Jesus. <laughs> uh, and, and we can't say that enough. And there's two reasons uh, for this. For one, Paul's understanding of who Jesus is and, and, and what Jesus hopes for us is foundational to who we understand Jesus is and what Jesus hopes for all of us. So it's one thing for Jesus to come and save. It's another thing for religion to be built up around that Jesus who comes and saves. And Paul does more to build up that religion than anyone else. He figures out who God is revealed in Jesus. We would call that theology. So the theology of God has really become the theology that all Christians of all stripes share to one degree or another. Um, and so you'll hear language in, in these Pauline letters that are just kind of standard language that we use because Paul was really the first thinker about who Jesus was and about how we create institutions around uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, and also living in the new age that Jesus brings. And that brings a second reason why Paul, uh, all of Christians owe a debt of gratitude to Paul. And that debt of gratitude is that Paul was motivated to convert everyone he met to Christianity, uh, which was a new idea in Judaism. Judaism accepted new members, they accepted converts, and they often had a lot of people hanging around the outer sides of their, uh, of their synagogues and, and of their um, faith places. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> but Judaism saw themselves as a chosen people, and their role was to be the best chosen people. And if they were the best chosen people, then the Messiah would come, and that Messiah would gather all people, and, and the center of all the people that would be gathered would be this light on the hill, the, the, these chosen people that were, um, that were near perfect in, in the following of God's hope and God's will for them. That's Judaism. So they didn't really care to bring more people in. They just wanted to focus on making their community the best representatives of God in the world. Paul instead was evangelical, we would say. His, his hope was to spread this good news of Jesus as a Savior. And, and he didn't care whether you spread that to a Gentile or a Jew, which was really crazy. 
Um, in fact, it put Paul in conflict, we can read in Acts and we can read in Paul's letters, it put him in conflict with the other leaders of the church who, like Paul, were born and raised Jewish, but unlike Paul, were not willing to shed all of the basics of Judaism in order to create this new cult around Jesus, this new religion around Jesus. Uh, the other Jewish leaders, uh, Peter and James, were the two uh, most powerful leaders of the early church, we believe. Uh, they, they were willing to shed some of Judaism, but not all of Judaism, in order to create this new Christian church. And Paul saw it, and Paul didn't think it was possible to do the evangelical work that God put on his heart uh, without shedding nearly all of uh, Judaism, especially the Jew Jewish laws. Um, so that put Paul on the outs with his Jewish Christian leaders, uh, but it also created a faith that looks a lot like our faith. We have to remind ourselves now uh, that we have Jewish roots. In fact, when we stop reminding ourselves that we have Jewish roots, our, our understanding of who God is revealed in Jesus starts to look different than who Jesus intended it to look. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He was uh, foundationally Jewish. He followed Jewish law. He lived in Jewish communities. He preached and taught primarily almost exclusively to Jewish people. If we forget that, then we forget something basic about our faith. Uh, on the other hand, we have never been Jewish. Paul was adamant that you didn't first become Jewish and then Christian. And that's what James wanted us to do in the early church. And Paul said, no, there's no way that we can spread this good news if we make that kind of hurdle for people. And so that means that we are people that have to be reminded of our Jewish faith, our Jewish roots, rather than the people who those Jewish roots are, are terribly apparent. Um, and, and, and so this becomes an ongoing issue in the midst of our faith lives. So that's who Paul was. And Paul was ambitious in starting this early church. If you go to that uh, handout that I have at the website, you'll see a map. And you can see how that map finds these Jewish churches all around the Aegean Sea. Uh, he gets to Athens, and then he's going to start going to Rome. And the idea was, was that these churches would be placed not in spots where there was a Jewish population, which would make sense, but in spots that made geographical sense so that they could be connected and they could support each other. So that there would be a two, three day distance uh, between each one of these cities so that they can give each other money when they needed money, give each other encouragement when they needed encouragement. So that these communities that he was going to start that were going to be radical in their faith, uh, and that's hard to do, uh, could at least provide support for each other. And also, when Paul traveled and his disciples traveled, they could visit from one to another, from one to another, from one to another, and kind of keep everyone in line, encouraged, uh, uplifted. Uh, and, so, and so there's real system. Paul starts in Jerusalem, works his way out along the Aegean Sea in this kind of loop, and then goes... His hope was then to go to Rome and then to Spain and to make the whole Mediterranean a, a, a Christian sort of hub of the church that then would work itself out from the sea into the land. Uh, you can almost uh, see a vision that Paul has, a vision that we believe as people of faith comes from the Holy Spirit and the hopes. We are Christian because of that vision that the Holy Spirit gave Paul. There's just no other way of saying it. This is how the Roman Empire became a Christian nation uh, in 4th century by the work of Paul in the 1st century. And then Paul uh, treated every one of these churches as if they were his children. Uh, and he was a stern parent. He, he got mad when, when they didn't uh, do the things that he had taught them to do when they misbehaved. And, and he also encouraged. And this letter to the Thessalonians is one of encouragement. Because we can't overestimate um, how hard it was to, be, to become part of a Christian community in the first century. 
There's some debate over whether there's any Jewish people in this Thessalonians churches. Most churches had a kind of Jewish core with Gentiles that then became part of it. And the conflict was over those Jews and Gentiles playing nice together. Uh, the, the Jews wanted the Gentiles to follow the Jewish law. Paul was telling them they didn't have to do that. But he wanted the Gentiles, too, to respect the Jews as they followed the Jewish law and, and to respect that Jesus was Jewish and, and Paul himself was Jewish uh, and, and that this was a valid sort of faith practice because Gentiles might look down on that because they thought Jews were some backwater re, uh, religion like we would think of voodooism or, or something like that in, in our world today. But it doesn't seem like that's the conflict in Thessalonians. If you read Acts 17, you'll read a story of how Paul founded the Thessalonian church. And it has to do with Paul going to a Jewish synagogue and starting there. Um, but Paul, in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, seems to indicate that there's no Jewish people at all. Paul wrote that letter to the Thessalonians around 50 CE. Luke wrote his, uh, his story around 80 or 90 AD, quite a bit later. Um, so our, uh, if there were Jews in Thessalonians, there weren't a lot of them. We haven't been able to find any synagogue in Thessalonica until the second century, so none in the time of Paul, archaeologists, archaeologists tell us. And there's no historical record either in the, in the rolls and the censuses that there were Jewish people. Um, so this would make Thessalonica in a unique church if it was all Gentile or if it was mostly Gentile. Um, and so a Gentile convert would have problems too because uh, Christianity, like Judaism, was exclusionary, meaning that you couldn't be Christian and also worship the emperor, and just as you couldn't be Jewish and also be Christian. <laughs> uh, you, you had to pick one and stick with that one. And it's a little f hard for us in the 21st century to understand this, but religion and civil life uh, were intertwined in a way that can't be pulled apart easily. Uh, so if you were a butcher, you were a butcher that worked for the temple. If you cut meat, you cut meat for the temple because all meat was first sacrificed at a temple and then it was butchered and sold to the people. So you could no longer be a butcher any longer if you became a Christian because in order to be a butcher, you had to work for the temple and you weren't allowed to work for the temple. Um, all the holy days, all the holidays that, that you would get as a worker in the Roman Empire had to do with some religion. And so you couldn't celebrate the feast days with the rest of the village uh, that you lived in because you no longer believed in whatever religious holiday you were celebrating. Um, and then there's just that weirdness of joining. Uh, imagine your child comes home and says they want to become Hindu. Uh, and you go, what? Hindu? That's crazy. We don't. There's no Hindus in our family. Well, what do you want to become Hindu for? And you would even look suspicious. Who, who's teaching you to become a Hindu? And you would look at that person that taught your child to become Hindu uh, with suspicion. Why are you leading my child away from the faith that they were raised in? Uh, well, that's the same reaction that Gentiles would have as they told uh, their family that they no longer are part of the Roman religions. They now want to be Christian. And so you were separated from your family. So early on in Paul's churches, uh, Paul encouraged them to see themselves as a new family. And then we hear Paul, or we hear the remnants of that in Jesus' teachings uh, that are recorded in the Gospels 30 years or so after these letters of Paul, uh, where Paul, where Jesus says, I have no longer a mother or a father or a brother or a sister. You now are my brother and sister. So Jesus encourages us in his, in his wanderings uh, that we create a new family in our faith. And that was really important to the early church because they needed a sense of community because they had to leave all of their community to create this, uh, to become part of an early church. Um, and so we still use that family language, but because Christianity in America is the dominant religion, we no longer feel like we are making a radical move in becoming Christian. I like to think that we are making a radical move because uh, most of the world, uh, most of our American neighbors, rather, are not part of a Christian church, and we are in the minority now uh, that we are. Uh, 
but our Christian mores are accepted as the standard. So living as a good Christian is very, very similar as living as a good American uh, in most respects. And when it's not, we, we usually take a lot of heat uh, for saying something different. Uh, but for Paul's communities, living, um, uh, this and this gets into the one of the last things I want to say today, is that <clears throat> Paul's understanding in Thessalonians of who God is revealed in Jesus is just at its infancy. We believe this is the first uh, saved letter of Paul. We believe Paul wrote other letters, but this is the first one that's been saved, and it was written and we can say this pretty confidently, around 50 or 51 um, CE. Uh, and we can say that confidently because Paul gives us a historical marker uh, that is easy for us to check up in, in 1 Thessalonians. And, uh, <clears throat> and we can see by the time Paul writes his last letter, which we believe to be Romans, uh, Paul's already got who God has revealed in Jesus kind of worked out. But early on, Paul is still trying to figure this out, and he's still trying to work this out. And so some of the things that Paul says, uh, he doesn't say, again, in Romans. You can see he's kind of moved past this, or his, his understanding of who Jesus is has matured. And other things become foundational. One of the things that becomes foundational for our faith is this idea that Paul had for who Jesus and the resurrection, who Jesus is and what the resurrection means. And Paul visioned it as two ages. There's the age that we live in, and then there's the age to come. And that age to come is the resurrection. And so Jesus is our future, uh, is how Paul imagined it. And Jesus lives in the age to come, and he's waiting for us to join him there. So Jesus is, we are going to be resurrected like Jesus. And the way we are resurrected like Jesus is we conform our life to who Jesus is in the resurrection. We conform our life now to who Jesus is in the resurrection. If I conform my life to the death of Jesus, then I will conform, then I will live my life in the resurrection of Jesus, is, is one of the sayings of Paul. So what that means is that we are to live as if we've already in this resurrected age, even though we find ourselves right now here. And that means we are to take up when the when the rules and the laws and the norms of the resurrected age conflict with our age right now, we are to choose the rules and the norms of the resurrected age. And for Paul's people, that had real consequences. So if you own slaves, Paul said you didn't have to give up your slaves, but you had to start treating your slaves as if they were your brother or your sister. Uh, in an age uh, that was not a cruel sort of racist slavery like we had in America, but still there were definite classes between slaves and owners, uh, Paul said those classes have to be completely broken down and you were to eat with your slaves because you would eat with your brother. And you were to be kind to your slaves um, uh, because you would be kind and generous to your brother. Um, similarly, women. Uh, Paul advocated for women having leadership roles in the early church, which women didn't even have the right to speak in public or own property uh, or, or work a job. And so Paul's got this radical idea of what how women should be treated uh, that... Um, you were supposed to live out because that's what the resurrected age looks like. But if you start treating women like that in the early church, you are going to look crazy to the rest of the culture. And in fact, we can see these later letters that are written in the second century, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. We could see the early church kind of pulling back from this and going, I don't know if we can live in the resurrected age as it comes to women. And so we see this much more restrictive language for women that they're not allowed to teach in the church. They're not allowed to speak in the church. They have to have their head covered at all time in the church. Uh, that kind of thing probably didn't come from Paul. Paul probably didn't write First, Second Timothy. It probably came from a later church who was pulling back some of the more radical ideas because basically it was hard to be that radical in this age. And we find that still today. Um, uh, we are to live in the age to come while we live in this age. And, and, and when those norms don't match up, we are to choose the ones 
Um, so the things we struggle with is that we are expected as good parents that we're going to give our children as many opportunities and encourage their bliss so that they become full individuals in this world. And so that means that if soccer is their, is their bliss, then we are to sacrifice whatever so that they become great soccer players or that they can follow this bliss. That's what a good parent looks like in the 21st century. However, you are to raise your child in the faith. Uh, otherwise, they won't know what the resurrected age looks like. And so if following their soccer bliss conflicts with raising them in the faith, then you are to choose to raise them in the faith. Whereas most Christians choose instead to help them follow their bliss. And they go on weekend uh, soccer retreats and, and everything else and, and Sunday morning soccer games. And they miss faith life. Um, so we have similar sort of conflicts in our own age. The last thing I'm going to say today is that um, Paul wrote these letters to Thessalonians, or Thessalonians in order to encourage them, in order to tell them um, uh, to keep on struggling to do this hard thing of, of being this exclusionary community, uh, but yet to continue to be out in the community. So there's a tension, right? You are to see this new family of people as your brothers and sisters, but that doesn't mean you're only to encounter and engage with this Christian community. Uh, Paul was constantly evangelical. You are to, brothers and sisters, you are to care for the poor, whether they are Christian or not. You are to, you are to share the good news of people uh, that aren't Christian. So you are to be constantly engaged in the community why you rely on the support and the encouragement of the community. And so, so this Thessalonians letter is definitely to encourage people. We don't know if there was a real problem in Thessalonians and Thessalonica that Paul's addressing. The problem doesn't seem to be terribly clear. Uh, he, he's in Athens, we believe, when he writes this letter. Uh, and he's heard a report from one of his disciples who he sent back to check on the church, Timothy. And this letter is prompted by Timothy's report. And with that, we will start this letter next week. And I'm hoping that our own Pastor Liz will uh, give one of these because I'll be on vacation next week. And Pastor Liz will be teaching the letter first um, of First Thessalonians. And you can read ahead. It'll be First Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 to 10 that we'll be looking at. And if you go to that um, document that I put on our website. You can see all the lessons we can teach if you want to read those ahead of time as you prepare for these. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, I look forward to having this journey with you through First and Second Thessalonians.